4 p.m. on August 17, 2021. And this is a duly filed and posted regular meeting, a special call meeting of the Alamo Heights Board of Trustees. Um, I will note this is a special call meeting. We had planned on having training, and that's what we will get to after the citizens be heard. But under Texas law, we're required to, any time we meet as an official body, allow citizens to come speak to us. Um, I would just advise everyone that we are not having any votes tonight. We're not having, we're not taking any actions. This is a training meeting. So while we are always uh, happy to hear comments and hear what's on the public's mind, we have a pretty good idea what's on your mind. But we will, after the public comments, go straight into executive session and begin our training. If anyone uh, would like to address the board tonight, as I said, we always welcome your opinion. You filled out the yellow forms by the door. Uh, the time is now closed for that. Because this is a special call meeting, we're going to only hear public comments related to specific posted agenda items. We have received 26 requests to speak on agenda item 4A. So when your name is called, will you please join us at the table to speak? A couple of things we just like to remind everyone of before we start speaking. The first is you have three minutes. Um, you will have, we've got a timer. Frank Stanage will be there. When you have one minute left, he will hold up a card. And then when your time is up, he will hold up a card. At that point, I'm not trying to be rude, but I am going to cut you off solely because we need to do that to be fair to everyone. Everyone has three minutes to speak. And so I'd ask when, we, when you see your time is up, please stop your presentation at that point. Also, in making your presentation, we ask that you not refer to individual students or personnel by name or position, especially in a public setting. It is best to be careful about comments about specific people. In addition, by state law, the board is not allowed to respond to your comments. And I want to emphasize that. Do not read anything into us all sitting up here with poker faces. By law, that's what we're required to do. We can't ask clarification questions. We can't answer any question that you ask us. We are required by law just to sit and listen. Finally, uh, I know looking at the uh, subject matter, we have many people here to talk about COVID protocols and masks. As you all know, this is a very um, heated topic in our public discourse. Last Thursday, we asked that everyone treat each other with respect, and we had a really good example of how civil discourse can go in our community. We accept that everyone who comes before us is speaking from their heart and what they truly feel, and we are going to give you the respect of listening to you. We ask that everyone in the audience do the same for each other. So please allow each speaker to speak in quiet. Thank you. With that, we are going to begin with Dr. Brandy Farrell and then Dr. Deborah Kahn, who will be next. You, you can pick your microphone and Dr. Kahn, you can start moving towards the other microphone. Hi, I'm a pediatric critical care nurse practitioner with 20 plus years of experience and I currently work at the large academic pediatric intensive care unit. But I'm here today as a concerned parent of two children who are unable to be vaccinated at this time. My daughter being home for the first day of third grade, having to be involved to wearing a mask from the boy two feet across from her. My experience in the hospital on the front line of this pandemic drives my concern. This is not an opinion or a political debate. We, as your local health care providers, are telling you that this is a very serious situation and a very real concern. When I have a bad day at work, families have lost the most precious gifted to them. We are having 
bad days at work. The health expert was nationally and locally agree that children spending eight hours a day inside need to be masked to prevent the spread of a highly contagious disease. Researchers have found that asymptomatic carriers of the Delta variant are infecting an average of eight other people, and locally, 98% of our COVID positive cases are the Delta variant. The district's own mission statement framed on the wall of the administration building says, we believe all individuals have an inherent value and all individuals have a responsibility to themselves and others. Universal masking is part of our responsibility to others and our society at large. This is more than just your family or childhood desires. We need to think of those in our community who can't protect themselves. My patients with regional heart defects, cancer, transplants, and other chronic illnesses are at extreme risk. This disease has taken many from our community, and I feel that our children wearing a mask inside is the least we can do as a society to protect everyone, especially the most vulnerable populations. The other part of your stated mission is that you will base all decisions on what's best for our students. The nonpartisan recommendations of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Center for Disease Control, have been devised on the best research currently available. These experts in the field have given you recommendations. Other political opinions should not be a factor in your decision-making process. For those who state the district can't police or patrol students not wearing a mask, you currently enforce a dress code and an electronic device policy. You should do the same for masks. Lastly, the AHISD motto and code of character states that we understand how we act and what we say, and we display, and what we display reflects the character and the values of that among our community. I would argue that protecting the most vulnerable among our community is the best way to teach our children compassion, empathy, and uphold the character traits of this district's values. Thank you. So your comment has to be on one of those two things. On the agenda. Okay, just, just turn it to COVID then. Okay, thank you. Thanks. My name is Dr. Deborah Khan. I'm an internist, geriatrician, and I practice palliative medicine. My practice doesn't uh, attend to the patients in our school district, so I asked our pediatrician, Renee Seavey, to come to speak tonight. She um, was unable because she's so overwhelmed, bombarded by caring for patients affected by COVID. So I'm gonna read a statement that she wrote. My name is Dr. Renee Seavey, and I own a solo pediatric practice located in Alamo Heights. I was asked to provide a statement in support of mask mandates in schools from the perspective of a general pediatrician for today's meeting. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to physically be there because I am wading knee deep in the havoc that is already present due to the lifting of mask mandates at the start of the summer, disastrously coinciding with the rise of the Delta variant of the COVID-19 virus. I have therefore asked Dr. Deborah Khan, who is the mother of two of my patients, to read the statement for me. It makes no scientific sense to me that with test positivity rates as high or even higher than at the start of last school year and the strain of the COVID-19 virus that now spreads two to three times faster than the predominant strain that was around last year, that we would not have the same physical measures in place to slow down disease spread. The existence of COVID vaccination this fall, which wasn't present last fall, is mostly an irrelevant argument because a majority of individuals in the school environment, all the kids under 12 years old cannot yet get the vaccine and can only depend on the measures that were in place last year, like masking, to protect them. Every day I get a call from at least three to five patients saying that either they are now positive and what should they do about their children or their children were exposed to someone in their classroom who was positive in the kids in daycare or whose schools have already started. In almost every one of these situations, if one family member becomes infected, the illness spreads through the whole family. In my almost 21 years of practicing pediatrics, I have never felt this hopeless about the state of health of my community in which I practice. I could keep going, but my day of nonstop patience is about to start. So, thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Adrian Duvall, your next Kate Hunger, you'll be it after. Thank you. Um, we know that only one, uh, about 38% of 
of students have any sort of immunity to COVID, and one to two percent of them who are infected will be hospitalized. My children's father is a critical care nurse, and nursing has changed because of COVID. In the past, when one of his patients died, he was given time to process, but now he does the paperwork and he moves on. It's death all the time. That's not gonna happen to many people, but it has changed nursing completely. He worked 60 hours a week in June with young parents, actually in the adult ICU who were dying. He coded a 28 year old mom. He held iPads up and let toddlers say goodbye to their parents. I read the email that said, the school board and superintendent don't have the authority to make a mask mandate. But also we have a character education program. And I would like to know if it's real or just words. We supposedly have a culture of care. How are we caring for my children that have to deal with a father that's seeing people die every day? Do you know how stressful that is to a family? ICU nursing did not used to be like that. It used to be a big deal when a patient died. It's not anymore. We, have an, we are supposed to have an opportunity for moral action and a responsibility for modeling ethical behavior. Other school districts have stood up to do the right thing and make mask mandates. They're showing a um, joint collective action, which San Antonio has a history of with our um, pecan shelters. We can stand with the other school districts and do the right thing, or we can teach all of our kids that the character education program does not mean anything. I'd also like to know my young cousin is in kindergarten. He's waiting on heart surgery in Houston for a tumor. Is there gonna be an ICU bed for him? What are we doing to ensure that the students in our community have ICU beds available? Because we have that responsibility. The mask mandates will, reduce the spread of COVID. We know from Castle Hills and other schools around the country that opening without masks will increase the spread of COVID and children like my cousin waiting on heart surgery will not be able to get the life-saving treatment they need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hey, Hunter is up and Dr. Timothy Baumgartner is next. My name is Kate Hunger and I have three children in this district, a senior, a sophomore, and a sixth grader at the junior school. I wanted to let you know that I'm with the newly formed Alamo Heights Community Alliance. And I want, you to, I want to urge you to listen and do four things that will protect students and staff and ultimately serve the goal that we all have, which is keeping these schools open. So first is, of course, adopting a universal mask mandate. But second, we want you to outfit every classroom and every gathering place with standalone HEPA air purifiers. HEPA air purifiers, not just the ventilation throughout the whole school building. Third, we want you to enforce, actually enforce social distancing, including the outdoor lunch that you have already stated is available, which we really appreciate. And fourth is providing virtual learning. Now, um, I want you to know that we have circulated a petition that as of this writing has at least 282 signatures. That's from parents and community members who agree that these are four priorities that you need to consider. Also, I want to tell you the reason that I'm here today. And that's because I have an 11 year old who needs to be in school, but she also is too young to be vaccinated. And I'm not the only one here in that situation. And as her mom, I have to make a very, very impossible Calculation. One is, do I protect her physical health by keeping her out of school where her safety largely depends on whether other students decide that they're gonna wear a mask? And then my other choice is, if I safeguard her right to an education by continuing to send her to school because I know that she needs to be there to get the education she deserves, and that by doing so, I have to accept the real possibility that she could contract COVID, even though we've done everything we can for 18 months to keep her safe. So that's a hard place to be. The health and safety of our kids must be the top priority of you and everyone else in this district and the use of standalone HEPA air purifiers, in addition to whole school ventilation, is an immediate, achievable, effective tool 
that will lessen the spread of COVID. And the great thing is this is something you can do right now. You do not have to wait for the courts. So please consider taking action to prevent our children to keep our kids safe with masks, the HEPA standalone air purifiers, social distancing, and virtual learning. And we'll be in touch to meet with you to discuss these requests. Thank you for your service. This is hard for everyone and for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Dr. Bonsoriner and Dr. Matthew Boardman is next. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm Dr. Tim Baumgartner. I'm gonna talk to you from four different perspectives today. One is a father, I have four kids in the Alma High School District. One as a youth sports coach, I'm actively involved coaching our young children. As a, phys as a physician, I'm a pediatric surgical subspecialist. And I'm also the acting chair of the Department of Surgery of one of our two level one trauma centers in San Antonio. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and as a husband. First off, I think we should congratulate everyone on the stage for a job well done last year. You guys pulled off a miraculous school year last year and a challenge that our country had not seen for over a century. Part of that included a universal mask mandate. This year, I argue that our challenge is even stiffer than it was last year. We're facing a Delta COVID variant that's even more virulent and transmissible than we had last year. We're also facing COVID fatigue, not only as a community, as a nation, as we're entering our 18th month of battling this pandemic. So I ask, why are we not taking the same measures that we took last year for this year? As a father with four children in the school, I saw what the first three months of home learning did to my children. Logging on to an iPad, they were disengaged, they struggled learning, they didn't have the interaction with children that you need for social development at this age. I want my kindergarten to learn in person how to read, not over an iPad. I want my seventh grader to play tackle football that he's been looking forward to for the past summer. As a youth sports coach, I can tell you last year I coached two flag football teams, two basketball teams, and a baseball team, all successfully through the COVID pandemic. And that teaches the kids teamwork, camaraderie, and competitiveness. Those are things that augment the development of our children. And those are things that they vitally need. It's also a nice athletic outlet for the children after they spend the day within school. As a physician, like I said, I'm a pediatric surgical subspecialist. I've already felt the brunt of the COVID pandemic for my practice, having to creatively reschedule children for surgery due to the lack of resources within the community. As the acting chair of surgery in one of our uh, trauma centers, my big concern is on the healthcare delivery in San Antonio, not having universal masks within school Children will be sick, schools potentially may need to close. That will impact the availability of our healthcare workers to work in an already stressed healthcare environment, having to stay home to care for their children. And finally, as a husband, my wife is an emergency medicine physician, and she's right now working a shift taking care of the sickest of COVID patients. At the height of the pandemic, she elected to move out of her house for a few weeks to protect us from the COVID. And through proper protective measures to include mask wearing, so far luckily she's a, she has avoided contracting COVID. So in conclusion, you guys did a phenomenal job last year taking our school district through the COVID uh, pandemic, which included a universal mask mandate. I argue that this year is even more challenging, so why would we do less? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Dr. Boardman is next, and then Amy Rahani will be after her Alan Rahani. Hello, my name is Matt <clears throat> Martin. I am um, Chief of Inpatient Medicine and a pediatric critical care physician in town. I work, um, I've worked at three pediatric intensive care units in the city. Um, I'm also <clears throat> chair of one of the national guidelines for treating uh, COVID um, in this country for uh, some, of our, some of our patients. So that said, um, I don't know how much needs to be said more on masks. I brought several articles because I hear some are still questioning the efficacy of masks, but I at least brought some articles to submit to the, um, to the board regarding um, the efficacy of wearing masks. Um, I talked to my, I have four children, I have uh, two, ages two, four, six, and eight. Um, my eight-year-old came back today um, saying that you know, one of the boys in her class who was not wearing masks you know, said to her that, well, her his parents said that getting better, it's not, kids aren't really getting sick, it's not a problem. So I'm just here to speak to that. Um, certainly one of our units right now in the city, there's about five kids with COVID, um, one who just came off um, something called ECMO, which is a heart lung bypass machine. 
I spoke to my colleague up in Dallas. They have five children um, with COVID up there. Two of them are on ECMO. Um, it is a problem, and these kids are much, much sicker this year. Um, last year, we only, only saw maybe one or two with active COVID. Most of the children I saw was from MIS, MISC, a complication to get COVID, which typically occurs about six to eight weeks after. So we haven't really seen that yet um, from this current wave. This is something that we can look forward to, if you will, in the next month or two. Um, with that um, syndrome, children, we have to send several children out of town here for um, potential heart transplants. It was that bad, um, that bad on heart lung bypass. So again, this is what we have to look forward to, and this is, you know, we have a few things we can do to mitigate this. Um, I agree with Dr. Baumgartner, you guys did a great job, and I felt a lot better last year in terms of the, the job you did. Um, with universal masking. So I'm asking you to continue universal mask, um, the universal mask policy. Um, we're, I also point out there's a um, study out of uh, NC State, um, which did some modeling, um, noting that in about a, um, for elementary school, um, with you know, kids coming in with about 30% protection of those who previously had COVID, um, without universal masking, without testing, other uh, um, school of about 500 kids, over the course of a month, you'd have um, approximately, um, out of 500 kids, 375 patients coming down with it. So again, it's, it's and that's a relatively conservative estimates with, um, with how infectious uh, this Delta variant is. So again, that's what we have to look forward to. Hopefully when that beat is that bad, because we have a lot of kids wearing masks. But again, our, our hospitals here at capacity, we're probably gonna have to send kids out of the city to other states whether it be from COVID or from whatever else, um, because we're at capacity. Thank you, Dr. Borgman. <laughs> Anne Rahani and then Dr. Laura Lindner will be next. Thank you very much. Um, good evening to everyone. Hope you're doing well. And um, I agree with the previous speaker. Thank you very much for everything you did last year. We need to continue that. And I uh, came to this thinking, how am I going to say to them, like, what can I say to possibly convince them that we need to do some, something about the mask mandate? And mulled over it last night. And I thought, well, what if you put yourself in their shoes? What is the one thing that's really going to make a difference here for them? What do they really need to be doing? And the question I have to ask is, what do, you, do you really want to keep these schools open? At the end of the day, as the board, that is your decision. It is your responsibility, and you can make that decision. San Antonio ISD is taking it through the teeth right now, but they are making that decision and putting in a mask mandate. They have a 2% positivity rate in a city that has 20% plus. Meanwhile, Capitol Hill, somebody mentioned earlier, about 477 students within three weeks of opening. As of today, I think they have about 70 in quarantine with positive ID, so it's only growing. The question becomes, how long is this mask mandate gonna last? Well, let's compare it to, say, a hurricane. If you have a storm coming and, you know, you're getting ready for it, peak of the storm is here, are you going to go outside while cars are flying around and trees are getting thrown around? No, we're going to stay in our houses, close the door. But for how long? A few days until that storm is over. We're in the peak of COVID right now in this city. If we can just, you know, push through, and have everyone masked up for three weeks, four weeks, until let's say the strategy is comes down to 100 cases a day. What we, what we need to do is just set a target and say, all right, let's get to a 5% positivity rate in the city. Then we can get rid of the masks. But for the time being, every single person that has spoken so far, and you're gonna hear more stories. I'm not here to talk about, you know, the emotions and the politics and all that. I get it, people are fired up. I'm here to find a solution that will work for everyone. And I think the one thing we all can agree on is that we need to keep these schools open. And we have a track record. Schools are closing all around the country. Tampa, 5,000 people. LA just tested 3,600 kids on their first day of school, positive. Um, Texas has already closed a couple of districts. Reno, Mississippi, Georgia. We have a choice to pick which strategy we want to take. There is a track record for us to review and look at. It is our responsibility to make the right decision because kids will get sick. It is going to happen. The mask won't eliminate all of it, but it will help. The question is, will you step up to the responsibility? And I hope you do, for all of our sakes. Thank you.
Kevin Lindenheim, Dr. Laura Linter, and Dr. Kara Van de Keek is next.
is the day I wonder if my daughter is going to be the next child to get sick. We know that the rate of hospitalizations of kids who are diagnosed with COVID-19 is approximately 2%. This may seem like an insignificant percentage until you actually consider our population of students. Per the district profile, we have approximately 2,000 kids in this district who are vaccine ineligible. If we allow COVID-19 to spread unchecked on our campus among the unvaccinated, this translates into roughly 38 children who will require hospitalization over the next several weeks to months. That's 38 classrooms who will be missing a child, 38 families who will have to face the fear and uncertainty of their child in the hospital, 38 patients whose lungs I and my colleagues have to look at and diagnose and treat. And those numbers, add those numbers all across the districts in this city, and we have a recipe for a countywide disaster. I will be reaching out to you to discuss these issues and the petition and our needs because I want to work with you to protect all of the students, teachers, and staff in this community. Thank you for your service to this community. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Andrew. Dr. Robert Bruton and Ruth behind the board is next. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Robert Bruton. I went to school in this auditorium, graduated from Alma Heights, as did my parents, actually. Uh, I'm an undergraduate uh, in biology and a, I'm a radiologist. I went to University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. I've been in San Antonio working as a diagnostic radiologist as well for 16 years in the Baptist healthcare system. And I am a live in the district and I have a fourth grade student in Cambridge and a sixth grade student in the junior school. I am here tonight both as a parent, a community member of Alamo Heights, and as a health provider. I also support the petition that I received and completed from the Alamo Heights Community Alliance. And I believe that the board should strongly consider implementing a universal mask mandate, outfitting all classrooms and gathering spaces with HEPA filters, also reenacting social distancing that we had previously enacted, including options for outdoor lunches, which we begin to do, and we do appreciate that, and also provide learning options virtually when needed, especially in isolation situations. I have an unvaccinated nine-year-old daughter in a classroom where approximately half of the students are unmasked. And it's critical that not only she stay healthy, but that she has a classroom to go to. When we look at the common ground, we all pretty much want the same goal, I really do believe. And that is having healthy children attend classrooms. My children, uh, both believe that masking helps, but I'm dismayed that it doesn't help in a situation where only half the classroom is masked, and that it not only prevents but, uh, receiving the virus, but also diminishes the spread of the virus to the kids. I've watched personally as a physician COVID cases rise significantly in San Antonio for the past two weeks until we are at critical levels, like you've heard from other multiple healthcare providers tonight. Our hospitals have been asked to stop elective procedures. We're seeing delayed services for EMS and rescue capabilities. ICU and COVID wars are in full or approaching full. We're seeing younger and younger patients falling more and more ill regarding COVID-related illnesses. It's unacceptable both to increase our child's exposure as well as overwhelm our medical resources as a community. It just doesn't make sense, especially when there are options that are doable. I want to thank you also for working so well last year and helping us get through a difficult time. And I encourage that you'll continue to help us do it this year as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Green. Ruth behind the board, and Matt Ford, you'll be next. Hi there, good evening. Dear Dr. Bashara and all the board members, I can only imagine how tireless your work has been, even more so as of late. I thank you for your dedication and hard work. My name is Ruth Manamore, and I wear lots of different hats in the district and in my personal life. And tonight I am here as a proud parent of Dante, who's a junior, and my oldest from Aiden graduated in 2019. I come tonight with two main thoughts. One is that language matters, and two, 
who is who we are as a community. In terms of language, personal versus public. Personal choice and that which only affects me has to take a back seat in times like these. We have been and continue to be members of a public health crisis. We all need to do our part for the greater good, and that includes having masks as mandated in the classroom. And in terms of who we are as a community, we are kind and think about each other, acting in ways to help each other out. At last week's board meeting, I listened to a community member, quote, remind you of who you are, end quote. And he went on to tell you exactly what your job is. Well, I know that I don't need to remind you of who we are as a community. You live here, you work here, your kids play with each other. We shop at H-E-B and have conversations in the aisles. We share recipes, we share life stories, laughter, and tears. The best practice the scientists and medical doctors, many including those in our community, have done an astounding job in. I can't even thank them enough for their hard work and for being here tonight at our last week's meeting to address those specific issues. They have told us time and again to wear masks, to help stop or slow down the spread of the virus. We must do this for each other, for our beloved Illinois community and our wives and our family. I recall many years ago when our kids wore their Woodridge t-shirts, and on the back they had our motto of, quote, live honorably, act humbly, and model dignity. Simple, profound, and something to strive for. We need to care for our most valued treasure, our children. I can't recall who said this, but there is no such thing as other people's children. They are all our children. By continuing our cultural care to include using masks in the classrooms, we live up to that motto and ensure that each of our precious children remain on the trajectory to greater heights. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Matt Ford, and then Ann David Gilman next. Okay, got a demonstration. Hi, um, oh, hi, I'm Matt Ford. I've got three children in the district, one too young to be vaccinated. Uh, like 50% of the student body. Um, my company uh, provides respir respiratory care throughout Texas. We're probably the <laughs> largest provider of pediatric ventilators in the southern United States. But today I wanted to refresh everybody's memories about what post-ICU COVID treatment looks like. For the last year and a half, I've been treating COVID patients, typically post-ICU. Now, it looks like a big concentrator like this, not like the small ones you get on TV, but a big hulking brute like this. And you've got a 25 foot cannula, okay, that connects you to that machine, so your life is now inside a 25 foot circle. The machine is hot, it is noisy, and it's running 24 seven. You know, you've got a leash, a 25 foot leash, and a 40 pound anchor, but hey, at least you've got one. There were many days last summer when I got requests from hospitals for 15 or 20 of these machines a day because they could try desperately to discharge COVID patients. Unfortunately, there was zero availability. I didn't have them, nobody had them. So patients were stuck on COVID wards, right? But now I want you to imagine your youngest child unable to leave the hospital because of the unavailability of these units. They're going to be surrounded by the sick. They're going to be hearing the coding of the dying patients. And you probably won't be able to be there to comfort them. You're going to be going through an iPad, just like we heard earlier on. Can you imagine the terror that child is going through at that time? So that's the part we're playing with, right? We've got two weapons here, we've got vaccines and we've got masks. Vaccines, we know are not good for 50% of our student body because they're too young, so that leaves masks. Our one weapon, and we're debating not using them. I'm just in utter disbelief. So I'm gonna leave you with my friend's situation. Um, a guy I played rugby with for many years, he was a great gymnast, he was a great rugby player. 
his son, 11, following his footsteps. Great gymnast, great rugby player, tons of potential, 11 year old Tom. Got a picture with the other day. Tom is being propped up, Star Wars Villa. Clearly a lot of pain. This is what the mother said. This is what secretary bacteria and pneumonia looks like. He's too sick to lie down. In absolute agony, screaming in pain as his left lung fills with fluid again and again and Thank again. Thank you, Mr. Ford. He has zero underlying conditions. We don't need Thank the binoculars to see where this is going. Mr. Ford, it's that's going to be a tragedy. And David. some of whom you've seen this evening. I do want to take a moment to say how deeply grateful I am, not just for their service, but for their willingness to share their stories, because that's hard, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge that. The Alamo Heights Community Alliance is asking for four things. To implement a universal mask mandate. To outfit all classrooms and gathering spaces with standalone HEPA air filters. To hold lunch outdoors for all students and enact other physical distancing measures which were successful last year and to provide virtual learning opportunities for families who need or want it by providing these mitigation measures as you well know for the delta variant of the covid of covid 19 we help keep schools safer and open i think of how different the news is from thursday from thursday the first notes of what was happening in castle hill were just starting, had been reported in the newspaper that morning. And now there are districts in Texas that are closed for two weeks, so the whole district can quarantine. Also, Dr. Walker shared the ways in which the data is showing how our students suffered educationally last year. I stayed the whole time. I looked at all of her beautiful charts in green and red. And you know what? As a doctor of education, I know how heartbreaking those numbers are. I appreciate that she put them in green, and you're right, we did do better than the rest of the state. But every one of those numbers is an individual child who didn't get what they need last, needed last year when things were working well. They're not going to be working well shortly without the things we're asking for. My kids had a great first two days of school. It was amazing to send them, I'm not gonna lie. They loved it, but I'm scared. Asthma, unvaccinated, what am I supposed to do? So the Alamo Heights Community Alliance will be reaching out to each of you individually to have meetings to ask you to consider our four requests for masks, HEPA filters, physical distancing, and virtual learning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Selena Montoya, and then Tim O'Sullivan is next. Well, first of all, good evening, and thank you for allowing us to address you this evening. My name is Selena Montoya, and I'm with the Alamo Heights Community Alliance. My children are in the first and fifth grade at Cambridge, and I have an infant at home. I'm here to ask the board to implement a universal mask mandate, outfit all classrooms and gathering spaces with standalone HEPA air filters, hold lunch outdoors for all students, and enact other physical distancing measures, as well as providing virtual learning for families who need or want it. As mentioned, I have an infant at home. His name is Henry. His uncle's call him Hank. And Henry was born earlier this summer, a little bit early, so he spent the first eight days of his life in the NICU. And that makes him susceptible to basically everything. I wouldn't wish a day in the NICU for any parent. We were very lucky, and though Henry had trouble breathing, he never had to be intubated nor put on a respirator. That was not the case for most of the babies there, those who continued to struggle to thrive. If you've ever been in a NICU, you know the incessant sound of beeps, alerting and tracking the staff with their patients' constant status. 
It was something we had to get used to. Our first night in the NICU, there was a different chorus of alarm bells as we caught a glimpse of one of the babies crashing. The doctors, and especially the nurses, performed swift and delicate life-saving maneuvers. It's not like the movies, it's not like the TV shows, but it was one of the most incredible displays of professionalism and care, and ultimately, fortunately, that baby stabilized. These healthcare providers can seemingly work miracles, but this new variant is proving it's going to take more than a miracle to keep our children safe and healthy, especially the most vulnerable, like Henry. Again, I asked for mandated universal masking, spaces with standalone tub air purifiers for all spaces, outdoor lunch for all students, as well as other physical distancing measures, and virtual learning for families who want or need it. As has been mentioned, as of yesterday, more than 280 other community members have signed a petition asking for these same things. I hope you'll consider this as you move forward, and move forward swiftly. I'll be reaching out as well to discuss these issues in the petition and our needs because it's our most desire to work with you. Thank you for your time, your service, and your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Concordia. Jim O'Sullivan and Sarah Jones is next. Thank you. As, uh, my name is Tim O'Sullivan. I'm speaking on behalf of my family, including a sixth grader at the junior school and a fourth grader at Woodridge. I'm also a member of the Alamites Community Alliance. I wanted to start by thanking you, not only for your heroic efforts last year, but also for your encouragement of masking in your last uh, superintendent's communication, Superintendent Bashara, on Sunday. However the political and judicial process plays out, and I really do see how you're all caught in the middle of a difficult situation, there's no law or judge forbidding you all from encouraging masking by students, staff, and teachers on every AH, AHISD campus. So I really hope that will continue because as we've seen tonight, it's such a necessary part of relieving the pressure on the hospitals that we all rely on for our health and safety. One thing that struck me about the meeting last Thursday was that folks on both sides of this issue all wanted the same thing, basically, which is to keep our schools open and as many kids going in person as possible. We just disagree about how to get there. Around the country, we're already seeing schools that don't open with universal mask mandates having to close, whether they want to or not. Uncontrolled COVID spread will come without a universal mask mandate. So for this reason, I also think it would be important in future communications from you all if we're given information about what benchmarks you all will be using in making decisions about how to keep schools open. It has been so clear in your communications how intensely you all want to have an uninterrupted school year, and we all want that. But it's less reassuring not to know exactly what the plan is if we're unable to control COVID spread in the schools. So today, as I mentioned, I'm here as part of the Alamo Heights Community Alliance, part of a group that wants to get back to normal schooling as soon as we can. We believe the quickest way back to a normal school year is to make COVID mitigation mission, as has already been mentioned, has already gained 280 signatures in less than 48 hours, and it asks for four specific things. Implementing a universal mask mandate, outfitting all classrooms with HEPA filters standalone, holding lunch outdoors as an option, and providing virtual learning for all families who need or want it. I too will be reaching out to discuss this petition and our needs, because we all want to work with you. Thank you very much for your service. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Sarah Jones and then Ben Kent will be next. Hi, my name is Sarah Jones and my daughter Emily, my, our daughter Emily is in sixth grade and I'm with the Alamo Heights Community Alliance. And as others have mentioned, our petition has 282 signatures in the last 48 hours since it's been launched. Our petition asks for a universal mask mandate for you to outfit, outfit all classrooms and gathering spaces with portable HEPA filters, hold lunch outdoors for all students, and enact other physical distancing measures, and provide virtual learning for families who need or want it. On Friday morning, we took our daughter Emily to Methodist Children's Emergency Room 
for what turned out to be an emergency appendectomy. They told us in the ER that if, if it wasn't ruptured, she would just stay 24 hours, that that's the protocol. Then they said she would have a bed in the oncology department a few hours later because they were you know, out of beds. Um, by the time she got out of surgery, the surgeon said that she was doing well enough that she could just go straight home. They were completely out of bed at that point. <clears throat> the good news was that it wasn't ruptured, and that's why the doctor was saying, well, she can go home. And then the doctor said, well, she might even be able to go to school on that day. At that point, I burst into tears. When the anesthesiologist walked up, she looked confused because she had been there. She knew everything went well. And I had to explain that I know it doesn't make sense, but who knew that Alma Heights Independent School District could feel like one of the more dangerous places for children to live in this city. I'm terrified to send my kid to school. And it would break, I knew it would break my daughter's heart not to get to go since she only was in person last, last, last year for February 1st on. As I was telling this, the surgeon said, don't get me started, my blood's already boiling. Two of my daughter's closest friends that live here in Alpha Heights are now at YWA, the Young Women's Leadership Academy at SASD, and at Aces uh, Northeast. They all had 95% compliance with masking without any mandate in place. This was prior to any mandate, any court battle, anything. That sounds like a culture of care to me. Now, I'm still glad I'm here. I'm glad my daughter got offered at YWA. She somehow naturally got a spot at Faces Shop. I know a few spots available in this city. We looked at our options. Our daughter loves to play the cello. It's, I mean, there's so many reasons to be here. We, we were thankful to have three good choices. So I'm glad I'm here because this is gonna make us all better. It's gonna make us all better people. My daughter gets to watch this. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Thank you, and Lisa Fox is next. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, ben Kent here. Yeah. Uh, fourth grader, nine years old, uh, vaccinated. Seventh grader, 12 years old, vaccinated, thankfully. And I'm, I'm really here just to, and I'm the one in awe of the other speakers here this evening, just to add my voice to the chorus. And to talk about a few things that I hope we can all agree on. Number one, COVID is our common enemy. We're all in this fight together. We have a common interest, which is we want our schools to stay open. We want our children to flourish in school with no interruption. And it's pretty clear to me that increased spread in our schools puts that at risk. That our schools, the more COVID spread we have, the more risk that our schools will not stay open. Besides vaccines, the simplest and easiest tool that we have to fight this enemy is masks, particularly for our children that are under 12 and aren't able to be vaccinated. Wearing this small piece of fabric is really almost nothing. If we were in the military, I mean, we'd, we'd all be working together, we'd all be armoring up to fight an enemy that's killed 700,000 Americans. It's, it's almost nothing. So, and also, we know that masks work. Look, look how well our school did, our school system did last year. It's, it's really amazing, and I, and I thank the board and, and for everybody that was involved in that. So I call on the board to do the right thing, to be the leaders that we've elected you to be, to minimize the risk to, to our schools, to our children, of having increased spread and increased risk of shutdown and require masks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lisa Fox and then Maribel Lepre will be next. Okay, hello? All right. So I'm here tonight because um, I want to thank the doctors. Y'all are better people than me because I would have quit by now. I would have. And all these people asking you to mass mandate. And I already know what's going to happen. Y'all will not mass mandate. Y'all will not go against the governor. Y'all won't do it, no matter what. The school will shut down. There will be spread of COVID. It will happen eventually. 
You cannot test. People will not test because they don't want to know if their child has COVID. Why would they want to know? So it probably will not show for a little bit, but in the end, it will start showing because kids will start get sick and it will spread. I just ask for one thing, to allow children that are unvaccinated, that are unable to get vaccinated under the age of 12 to be able to stay home and still go to school online. And it could be so simple as Google Classroom. My two young, young sons are right now quarantined with my, my mom because they were exposed. And all they have is a computer and Google Classroom and they, they do it easy. I know a lot of kids did not do online class easy, but mine did. So if the bare minimum of that could be provided, I would appreciate it the highest. And so would my children because they don't feel safe. No, even with the mask on, they don't feel safe because they know the facts. If their children are there with no mask on, they can potentially get COVID and get sick. I mean, who in their right mind wants their child to even be sick? I have never seen so many mothers sign up for their children to get sick, even for five days for a fever. Like that's, CPS should be called for that. <laughs> I know that you get about two to $5,000 a student, I believe, per year. Divide that by 180 days, I believe, is what necessary for a child to be in school. That's 16, 17 dollars a day. If just put a price on it, put a price on it, because I promise you, if you put a price on it, Alamo Heights will raise the money to fundraise for it. If it's not going to be paid by the government, it will be paid by the parents, because I know we would rather pay that than have to deal with COVID spread in our community in our children that are innocent in this stupid fight over a small piece of thing over your mouth. I can breathe in it, it doesn't affect my oxygen, it won't kill me to wear a mask. And it's sad to see that some children do not have that support at home and they feel like they cannot put a mask on because their parents don't believe in a mask. I have seen this. And then the bullying of masks is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And this is all because of a little piece of cloth that never should have became a political fight, never should have became an option, never should have been a choice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Mayor will be left hand, and Becca de Feliz will be next. Good evening. My name is Maribel Lepe, and um, I have two beautiful boys. One is, in, one is a seventh grader, and the other one um, just started Monday, a first grade at Cambridge. She's super excited. Um, I am here as a concerned parent due to the risk that not having all kids wear masks represent. I believe that as a community, we have to be more empathetic and mindful of the needs of others. In the past couple of days, I have heard concerns from parents whose children have underlying health conditions, such as chronic asthma, just like my own son. I feel that it's important that we must stand do everything we can to keep our children safe. Sorry. And the school system should do the same. Implementing a universal mask mandate can help reduce the risk and infection in infecting a child with an already compromised health condition. And save another family from the danger this virus represents. In addition to further the efforts to keep our children safe, and feeding as many classrooms as possible with standalone HIPAA air purifiers will help ensure the safety of not only our kids but also faculty members. We have to take care of our teachers. They are amazing. I believe that minimal actions, such as holding lunches outside and simply keeping distance from one another, can be the key to preventing yet another child to fall victim to this virus. Parents should be provided with the option of virtual learning. 
um, for kids that really do need that help. I appreciate everybody, everyone, taking the time to listen and to take into account the concerns um, of every single parent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. President. President Police, and then Dr. Paul Bertolino is next. Hi, my name is Deputy Police, and I'm the parent of an under 12 Alamo Heights Junior School student. Like many parents, our family was forced to choose between the physical and mental health of our daughter when deciding to send her back to in person school this year. I appreciate that our district, state, and country have faced unprecedented challenges with the COVID 19 pandemic in the past 18 months. Last year, the district provided an exceptional learning environment during an ongoing emergency with the hard work and dedication of the teachers, staff, students, and family. The district has proven that it's possible to overcome the challenges of this pandemic by committing to the common goal of ensuring student and educator success. As a parent, I'm urging you to implement universal masking at all district buildings for students and staff, regardless of the changing city, county, or state mandates. A growing list of Texas districts have, in accordance with the CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics COVID-19 guidelines, implemented this policy to mitigate the spread. The following Bear County ISDs included San Antonio, Edgewood, South Sand, Judson, Carlindale, Fort Van Houston, Randolph, and Lawson Fields ISDs. Other Texas independent school districts include Dallas, Houston, Austin, Richardson, Round Rock. I have a whole list. In comparison, the first ISD to experience a district-wide shutdown was forced to do so after just six days of welcoming students back without a universal mask mandate. Ultimately, we trust that the board trustees who campaigned and were elected to safeguard our children's education and educational environment will act in the best interest of our students. We all want schools to return to normal for the sake of our students and educators, but with over 54,000 COVID-19 deaths in Texas, and the rapidly spreading Delta variant, we are not operating in normal times. The expert recommendations are clear. Vaccines and universal masking are paramount to the prevention of COVID-19 infections and will reduce the risk of campus and district-wide closures. With approximately half of AHISD students under the age of 12 and thus ineligible to receive the vaccine, universal masking is our best hope of reducing educational disruption. I urge you to implement this policy, and I thank you for your time. Um, I also have the written statements of nine other parents who were unable to attend because of work. So I'm just going to bring those up for you. Thank you, Ms. Davies. <laughs> Dr. Paul Evelina and Holly Keith will be next. director of radiology for Methodist South, and um, he very diligently sent me his statement, so if you guys don't mind, I'll read it. Um, oh, real fast, we've got two kids in the district, one's unvaccinated, and she just started Cambridge, and it's awesome, but, you know, not enough kids in masks. All right, my name is Paul Bernalino. I've been a practicing interventional radiologist in Texas for the last 10 years. My family and I have been part of the Alamo Heights community for the last six years, and as a physician, I have witnessed this pandemic firsthand since the beginning. It often begins when the patient arrives in our ER and they have chest x-rays that show multiple KC areas of pneumonia. The patient may be admitted as the infection takes hold, and my department is consulted to help treat some of the many complications of the initial infection. Seemingly in a predictable, stepwise fashion, the COVID patient's lungs become progressively hardened and scarred, making oxygen exchange much more difficult. Finally, the patient may develop a collapsed lung as the architecture of the lung fails, and first we try a small chest tube to reinflate the lung. We may soon proceed to the largest chest tube available, or even multiple chest tubes, in an effort to keep the lung inflated. At this point, there's little chance for rehab, and the patient will very likely succumb to another complication, such as sepsis. As a physician and parent, it's most difficult to comprehend that most of this is now preventable. Preventable. Many have chosen to continue to choose not to follow the recommendations of the experts 
in our society that we have educated and groomed to keep us healthier and happier than previous generations. Many cite freedom and their right to make what many of the experts would deem poor decisions for themselves and their families. As a physician and parent, their freedom ends when it affects the health of me and my family, specifically my unvaccinated daughter. When they choose to not wear a mask or obtain a vaccine, they risk me being exposed in the hospital and then returning home to infect my unvaccinated daughter. And when they fight to have their child go to school without a mask, their poor decision places my unvaccinated child directly in harm's way. As a physician and parent, I am pleading with you to implement a universal masking policy regardless of what the city and or county dictates. Please wear a mask and get, get vaccinated. It is literally that simple. Um, and as his wife, I agree with him. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Bernardino. Alan Keith, and then Carlos Sepuentes is next. Good afternoon. I want to thank you for your willingness and your attentiveness in hearing all the parents who are here today speaking on behalf of our children in our community. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician at UT, specializing in uh, treating patients who undergo lung transplantation. So over the last year and a half, I've heard some of the worst of the worst stories with regards to the ravages of COVID on particularly the lungs of but I'm also the mother of a third grader at Cambridge Elementary, and I'm here today asking you to act on her behalf, as well as the rest of the students within Alma Heights Independent School District, and enact a universal masking policy this year, regardless of how the political winds may blow. As we're all aware, as many parents have said here today, COVID is um, continuing to increase in our community, and we all know that the Delta variant causes more severe illness and is more infectious, even amongst kids. We're seeing it in schools that have opened without universal masking policies, such as Castle Hill. We're seeing it in our PICUs and in our children's wards and inside the hospitals. We're seeing more sick kids. We've adopted these ideas that COVID doesn't cause severe illness amongst kids, and so it's not really a big, a big deal. But I think as going forward, you'll see that that's not necessarily the case with the Delta variant. My mother-in-law is a critical care attending at Methodist, and she wanted to be here tonight but unfortunately couldn't because she's taking care of sick kids in the PICU with COVID. These are the things that keep me up at night, but the things that really worry me are what happened this morning as we were waiting for the school bus on the second day of school. My daughter said to me, I don't feel it's as safe at Cambridge this year as I did last year. Last year, the school district did a great job of keeping kids safe. There was no in-school spread because of universal masking, because of social distancing, because of the plexiglass at the desks and in the school and the cafeteria. But this year, a lot of that is gone and my daughter doesn't feel as safe. And I think that that's really scary and really unfortunate for her learning experience. And so, I would ask you to base the policies for the coming school year in science, in CDC guidance, and in active universal masking policies, just like school districts in San Antonio, in Dallas, in Houston have done. Do the right thing for our kids, make choices based on science and fact, and regardless of the politics of the state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlos Sepuentes, and Heather Rosenquist is next. Thank you, members of the board, once again, uh, for your excellent work in the previous year, uh, bringing us to um, another year of education. Our daughters are so excited to begin the year, and I'm glad to be able to go home and tell them that the, the dedication that the board is giving to try to make sure that this year is safe and successful. Uh, I mentioned at last week's uh, previous board meeting that you know, we have a, a daughter uh, who's a sixth grader now and uh, one in high school. Uh, yes, they both happen to have uh, essentially underlying conditions. One, uh, lupus, another immune condition, another residual um, symptoms uh, recur from a previous bout of pneumonia. Hearing some speak uh, at the last meeting, um, I could sense, you know, it's, it's not easy to be confronted with so many stories that are, are sad or scary or, or uh, maybe, you know, or terrible. I mean, they're, they, they draw on a sense of pity. It, it's hard to get to compassion. And, and I know that I'm biased. I have the two children with their needs. 
And I'd like to think that I'd come at it from a similar concern, even if I didn't have uh, a sister who's about to begin chemo, it will be added to that population of those whose immune system will protect them uh, in, in the current environment. I'd like to think that I'd have the same uh, kind of preoccupation with, with the stakes, even if I hadn't heard that one of my daughter's teachers sent an email saying that uh, she's a, a stage four um, cancer patient. Um, but all, all to say, what, what can be done? Uh, for all the considerations that you want to take, what can be done? I, I stand here in favor, uh, dead my voice to those who are in favor of universal masking. Uh, while conditions require, and for so long as conditions require, uh, no matter whether other levels of government lose heart, lose will, or lose conviction. Uh, it's okay for the district to take a stand and uh, express what they think is best to protect those uh, in our district. Those, not only the youngest and most vulnerable, but those whom an uh, asymptomatic or symptomatic student would come into contact with. When we talk about personal responsibility, I think we need to take that further and imagine the chain that we can interrupt with sound policies and, and good protective measures that protect our community at large. What do you tell the student who not only becomes sick, but maybe feels that they've got someone else sick? It's a heavy burden for our youngest, and I think the board's in a position to follow a good policy that protects the safety and education of our students. I wish you uh, the best in this tough decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sepulchre. Heather Rosenquist, and then Ashley Beekman will be next. My name is Heather Rosenquist, and I'm a parent of a sophomore and a senior here at the high school. I want to start by echoing the statements of those before me and saying thank you so much for your service and everything that was done last year to protect our students' health while also providing exceptional learning options. It was and truly is appreciated, and I ask for the same consideration this year including universal mask, including a universal mask mandate. In the, context, in the context of the pandemic and the Delta variant, I thought we should take a look at our district's rallying motto or tagline, live honorably, act humbly, model dignity. To live honorably is to be someone who believes in truth and doing the right thing. The truth is that COVID isn't over, the Delta, uh, Delta variant is here, and we can do something to help prevent our children from getting sick. Doing the right thing is to be masked up. To act humbly means to be unpretentious. Let's be unpretentious. Let's not think that we can be unmasked and not get COVID. And finally, to model dignity. Dignity means to be worthy of honor and respect. The very best way we can honor and respect each other is to protect our students and their health. So I ask you to please act swiftly on a universal masking mandate. We want our schools to stay open and we want to protect all students, both the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Thank you. I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Ashley Beekman, and then Joe Gahn is our last one. Woodridge, one of the 
vaccinated until then, they will continue to wear masks. Our children can do this. They did it all last year, and the district has the resources. Um, the simple and effective plexiglass that's no longer up. Um, thinking for my children, I know they do want to end up back at home, or they do not want to end up back at home doing virtual learning. They love their school, their teachers, their friends, and they need the psychosocial benefits of in-person learning. After just one day at school, my kids came home telling me about four children in my son's class not wearing masks, one child in my daughter's class, and also her teacher elected not to wear one. In addition, my third grader reported seeing several teachers throughout the school not wearing masks. This concerns me. Um, we started the year with six teachers out, and that wasn't enough to assign utilized precautions. When my six-year-old son reminded his friends to wear a mask, they told him they didn't have to, and the teacher agreed. That's not the support we need. We need a universal mask mandate and social distancing. And this evening, I'm a little disappointed by the lack of masks on the board and the lack of masks seen at the um, Meet the Teacher last week. It, what example are we setting for our kids? It's our responsible as the adults to set the norm. My children, my young children, even know to wear masks not only to protect themselves, but out of respect for those around them and the possibility for the asymptomatic spread. Thank you. Thank you for speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, three kids, a fifth grader, third grader, first grader. All are too young for vaccines. So that is one drop off a day, which is very important for you guys to understand. Uh, there are so many doctors here tonight, uh, and I'm sure uh, they should be, I should not be the one to close this out. Uh, uh, I'm an accountant, and so I'm not going to talk about the medicine, uh, but I will talk about, I'm an analytical person, I'll talk about the practicality. And, and like you, I want to keep our kids in school, period. It is simple. Without a mask mandate, we'll have to continue to have positive tests, more quarantining. Uh, increasing disruptive for education of our students, and more importantly, our students will need to be quarantined. Distance learning was very difficult last year, and right now, based on the current path, the only question in my mind is not if we will be quarantined, but how, how soon before that happens. So many need to explain to me why it is so difficult to wear a mask. We did it all last year. I can't speak for others, but my kids do not care about wearing masks. Oftentimes, they'll walk in the house still wearing their masks. These are the same kids that complain that their food is too hot and their ice water is too cold. Uh, these are, you know, I want to thank everyone for your time, your service, and the tremendous job that was done last year. Thank you all for wearing your masks tonight. Uh, you, you are demonstrating the fact that you can understand that the disease is being transmitted not just by those who are vaccinated, but also amongst those who are unvaccinated as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> the public speaking part of our program. We are now going to go into executive session for board training. We're going to recess until 6.30, but again, thank you for coming. We appreciate your input, and we will see you again soon.